Outreach San Diego. How many can say amen? Come on, give God one more big praise, everybody. Man, that's going to be tough to preach. My God. We messed around and tore the house down before I even got up here. I mean, though, that's what it, that's what it ought to be like. Can I hear an amen? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, so much. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn them with me to Haggai chapter 2. And I want to remind you, you know, we're starting at 9 o'clock now. And uh, some of you guys look fresher, happier, a little bit more rested. Can I hear an amen? So if you got here at 830, we're glad you got here to pray. But now we're starting at 9, and, and I encourage you to keep coming at 830 to pray. Praise God. I stepped into the house this morning, and you felt the environment of the power of God in this place. How many can say amen? And that's what we need in 2019 is more of God's power in our life. Amen? So if you can stand with me for the reading of the word, Haggai chapter 2. And when you have it, say amen. If you can't find it, go to the book of Malachi and make a left. All right. <laughs> Go to Haggai and make a, Malachi and make a laugh. Haggai chapter 2, we're going to begin reading, uh, if you will, with me. In, let's go into verse 3. Verse 3. It says this, it says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? It says, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, and be strong, all the people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, and do not fear. Verse 6, it says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, and I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, look at this, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I like this part, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Somebody say praise the Lord. And then finally it says, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former and in this place i will give peace says the lord of hosts praise god before you're seated look at your neighbor tell me you look good this morning and you may be seated i'm fired up to minister today and you sound fired up to receive today the word that God has given me this morning, I, I, I think if I were to think about this word, I, I, I'd probably say this is a necessary word. I mean, though, sometimes when we come to the house of God, we need a necessary word. And in the book of Haggai, in the book of Haggai Israel had just returned from captivity from Babylon and what they started to do is they started to work on their homes and their businesses and to establish their statehood as a Jewish community. And one thing they had neglected to do was to first build the house of God. They, they were derelict in the construction of the temple in keeping the Lord as the central focus of all their hopes and all their dreams. And when we read here in Haggai chapter 2, what we, what we find here is that the message of Haggai was a prophetic clarion call. A prophetic call. Somebody say prophetic. A prophetic call that shook up but also encouraged the nation to keep God at the center of all things. And what this prophetic call was saying to the people of God was that their identity was not in the home they lived in, but their identity was in the plan of God. 
Are you hearing this? Their identity was in the plan of God. That as long as God was at the center of their life, they could fight any battle. That as long as God was at the center of their life, they could overcome any obstacle. Because how we know the Bible teaches that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Their identity was in God and nothing else. And what God's desire for Israel, and I believe God's desire for us, watch this, is to make Israel the envy of all nations. To make Israel and to raise Israel up that every nation in the earth would envy Israel. And I believe with all my heart that when God remains the center of your life, you become the envy of those who are lost. Somebody talked to me this morning. When David, King David, failed to bring the ark into Zion the first time, the Bible tells us that he parked the ark at Obed-Edom's house. And for three months, Obed-Edom hosted the presence of God in his living room. And the Bible tells us that his house was greatly blessed. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. So what am I saying this morning is that when you find your identity in Christ, everything else in your life will be handled by the Lord. And that's good news for somebody, isn't it? See, God opens up our favor. God takes care of those who trust him. God is opening up our future and God is able to turn us into something powerful for his glory. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you this morning, it's going to set me up to talk to you about being a risk taking church. But the reason I'm sharing with you this morning, this important subject, this necessary word is because so many Christians and so many churches fail to fulfill their God given destiny. So many churches even fail to step in to God's perfect plan within that church's life. Now, why do so many Christians and churches fail to reach their destiny? I want to give you three reasons. Number one, write this down, is that they fail to grow spiritually. They simply stop praying. They simply stop believing. They simply stop attending church. And what happens is they lose their sense of priority. Say that with me. Say priority. And what happens to those people is their faith becomes stale and becomes stagnant. Have you ever eaten a stale, hard piece of bread? Their life becomes like old bread, hard and sour. Oh, come on, somebody. They're no longer attracted to those who are seeking. And what happens is when they stop praying, stop attending church, stop believing for the miraculous, they're, they're, they lose the power of God in their life, and their life is no longer sweet. They no longer carry the oil that heals the hurts of people. They no longer carry the solutions to life's challenges. The second reason Christians and churches fail to reach their destiny is because they fail to maintain the passion and fire that they started with. Watch this. They go from being a movement to being a monument. What is a monument? A monument is an image of former things. We post homage, uh, uh, monuments based on not things that are about to happen. Well, we put up monuments based on things that have already happened. And I want to tell you that to be a move of God is to not be afraid to respond to the new challenges of kingdom living. What I believe God is saying to us this year is he's saying, I want to keep you alive. And that's why I'm giving you fresh challenges. Come on, somebody. I know some people, they, they don't like to be challenged. They don't like new challenges. They don't like change. But what I want to say to you this morning is if you want to stay alive. Come on, who says I'm not, I'm not going to die? I'm going to stay alive. Then understand that the kingdom of God will always present new challenges. This year might be a year you have to forgive your enemy. 
This might be a year where you might have to usher in healing into your family. There are some new challenges that God is going to place before you. But I came to tell you, Victor Outreach San Diego, it's the new challenges that keep us alive. How many can give God praise that his challenges are keeping us alive this morning? And I want to tell you this about challenges is that challenges are what make the Christian life exciting. When you're not challenged, you become bored in the house of God. When there's not something new to step up to, there's nothing to pray about. Talk to me this morning. But when God presents a new challenge in your life, you've got to get on your knees and begin to pray. That's when new excitement and new zeal begins to stir up within your life. The third reason some churches fail to reach their destiny, you getting this so far? And this is the part I want you to really hear, is that they fail to reach their God-given goals. I, I got to tell you that today, many churches that were once built are empty and aged. And the reason they are is because the people have lost their desire to worship and work for God's purpose. When I started this message, I, I told you this is a necessary word. Look at your neighbor and tell him this is a necessary word. Because even though our church is far from death, sometimes the symptoms of death could try to creep in. Come on, somebody. See, we're not dead, but we've got to watch for the symptoms. Woo! When, when, you, when you start feeling things in your body, when you start feeling things in your body as you hit 40, as you hit 50, come on, somebody, your, your doctor visits become a little bit more frequent. And what I believe this is a necessary word is because he hasn't called us to be a monument. He's called us to stay a prophetic movement. Are you hearing me today? And we've got to check the symptoms of our life and check the symptoms of our church because the truth is, is that some churches do pass away. Some churches do die when the people of God lose the desire to worship, lose the desire to work for God's purpose. They lose the desire to sacrifice unto the Lord. They lose the desire to sacrifice and make changes unto the Lord. Are you with me on this work? I've been talking to a lot of realtors lately. You know, you know we're always dealing with realtors and different realtors, and we've got to kind of stay on the cutting edge of real estate. And you know that many realtors out there, even here in San Diego, are asking churches to start sharing buildings, to start sharing buildings. There, there's a shortage of buildings out there in San Diego for churches. They call them special use facilities. And there's a shortage of buildings. And we were talking to one real estate agent, and he says, you know what's happening in San Diego now is a lot of churches are, are coming together to share a building. And he said, isn't that exciting? Isn't that beautiful? And I thought to myself, that's horrible. I don't know of one ministry that would want to share a building with Victory Outreach. And I'll tell you why. Because we'll take over that building. <laughs> We're not just a church on Sunday. We're a church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? But I thought how sad that is. I thought how sad that is because you're talking about a church that once had a vision from God. A church that once had a mission, a church that once had people who were hungry for the presence of God, once had people that wanted to worship, that were bold in their faith, that were so winning. A church that at one time was wrapped up in the vision that God gave them. But what happened? They lost their sense of vision. They lost their sense of mission. I think some churches die. Watch this because they want to be deep. Beware of becoming deep. You might get so deep, we lose you. We're going to have to put on scuba gear. We're going to have to go into a submarine and go down so deep to find you, to bring you back into the plan of God. You ain't saying nothing to me this morning. And they want to get deep. 
They want to get deep. They get so deep, they lose their sense of vision. They lose their sense of purpose. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't grow in the word of God. I'm not saying you shouldn't grow theologically. But understand that even theologically, God has given us a mission. Jesus said, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I came this morning to give you a necessary word. Tell your neighbor, this is necessary. And what happens is when we become conservative, we begin to lose our radical spirit. My prayer for you, Victory Outreach San Diego, is no matter how blessed you get, and no, and no matter how much God increases you financially, and no matter how much God raises your status in the community, I don't care if you once drove a busted up Toyota and now you're driving a BMW. Do not lose your fire. Do not lose your radical spirit. Do not lose your spirit of evangelism. Come on, somebody. Stay radical. Tell your neighbors, stay radical. Tell them, please don't die out on me. Don't let your blessings kill you. Don't let your increase kill you. Stay with a radical anointing, the anointing of victory, outreach. Let it keep burning within your life. Hallelujah. Thank you. See, here's what I want to say is God hasn't forgotten what he's called us to do. But sometimes we could forget what he has called what we what he has called us to do. And those who step into the future are those who are willing to fight for the vision and who are tapping into God's presence and saying, watch this, I will never let go of the vision God has given me. Has God given you a vision this morning? Has God given you a promise this morning? Then don't let it go. Hold on to that vision no matter what. Come on, give God a praise if you're going to do that. I want to give you this message very quickly. There are three types of churches in the world today. And I feel, feel this is so necessary for every one of us to receive this morning. Are you, are, you, are you receiving this today? The first type of church is what's called the undertaking church. The undertaking church. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 8 and 9, the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Until the time of weeping and mourning was over, and now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. As great of a leader as Moses was, watch this, God did not allow Israel to mourn Moses for more than 30 days. Look at your neighbor and tell them your 30 days is up. <laughs> Come on, give God a praise. You're 30. You're on day 29. You got one day left. Can I hear an amen? Why, why, why did God do this? Because God wanted to teach Israel that we value the past. We learn from the past, but we do not live in the past. We, we learn from the past, but we do not worship the past. See, people, uh, Israel was being taught, watch this, that the vision was bigger than the personality leading it. The vision is bigger than the personality. Personality fades, but vision remains the same. The vision remains the same. Personality is hot one minute and cold the next minute. You like this preacher one minute, you like this other preacher the next minute. But the one thing that should never grow cold is the vision that God has given you, the promise that God has given you. Can I get anybody to say amen in this place? He's given you a powerful vision. And so he's telling the people of Israel, watch this, don't linger around dead things. See, people who linger around dead things and stall out in the plan of God is because they allow the past to become their identity. They say that the best days were yesterday. They say things like this. Things aren't the same anymore. People say, oh, I liked it better when. Come on, somebody. Some people flash back so far. They say, I remember when. But one thing my pastor taught me, Pastor Sonny, and I've heard him say, he said, if what you did yesterday was, was seem big, you must not be doing much today. 
And I came to tell you, God has not called us to stop working and stop worshiping and stop building for the glory of God. See, God doesn't want us to linger around dead things. Some people value the past so much they can't step into the future. And a dying church has a tendency to revert back to old memories, old ways, and old mentalities. Their mentality is that their best days are behind them. But I came to tell you on this Sunday morning that vision never goes backwards. Vision always takes you forward. If you're a part of this church, understand we're not going backward. Our best days are still ahead of us. The blessing is on its way. The best is yet to come. The promise hasn't changed. The breakthrough is coming. He just needs for somebody to come out of the grave this morning and start stepping into the future. Tell your neighbor, don't go back. I want to tell you, we can't make decisions based on what worked in the past. We can't make decisions based on who used to be here. Well, this one used to be here and that one used to be here. Well, I came to tell you, people come and go. People are in your life for a reason, for a season, but then there's those ones that are in it for a lifetime. And people come and go, but I came to tell you, it doesn't matter who comes and who goes. The vision stays the same. The mission stays the same. The person, the purpose stays the same. And I came to tell you, we are blessed to be part of it. We are blessed to journey with God. We are blessed to go wherever God calls us to go. Am I preaching good for you this morning? The second type of church is not only the undertaking church, but secondly, what, what could be described as the caretaking church, the caretaking church, where the undertaking church focuses on the past, too much on the past. The caretaking church focuses too much on the present. What I think of when I think of a caretaking church is I think of a distracted church, a, a church that allows the problems of this life to move them forward. It allows the problems of this life to stop them from moving forward. See, what I believe a caretaking church is, is it's a church in maintenance mode. <laughs> Remember I told you that some churches could die? Some churches could close up? Some churches could lose their vision? Well, I believe that we find ourselves in danger when we move our church into maintenance mode. And you know where maintenance mode begins? Maintenance begins in the leadership. <laughs> That's an ouch. That's an ouch. Can I hear an amen? It's when leaders become guilty of developing a survival mentality. Come on, somebody. You used to pray for people's needs. Now you want people praying for your needs. You used to minister to others. Now you need people to minister to you. And I, did, I, I, I dare to say that you have moved into a survivor's mentality. You came out of 2018, you say, I'm glad I barely made it. <laughs> Leaders like that scare me. I said, there's something wrong with you, Jack. Because God hasn't called you to walk in defeat. He's called you to walk in victory. There might be some things going on in your life that you can't control. There might be some things in your life that don't make sense. But understand, as leaders, we're called to walk higher than the storm. We're called to walk higher than the storm. Can I hear an amen? When, a leader's an eagle. A leader's an eagle. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you're an eagle. You're not a turkey. You're not a duck. You're not a dirty bird. Can I hear an amen? Touch your neighbor and tell them, you're an eagle. And the reason I know a leader is an eagle is because when the storm rises, come on, somebody, the eagle begins to open up their wingspan and allows that storm to fuel their height and elevate them to a whole nother level. And if there's anyone here this morning that you might have had some storms in your life, but those storms didn't get the best of you, those storms didn't knock you out the box, those storms said, I'm, you're going to a whole nother level. I'm going to need you for the next five to ten seconds to begin to give God some praise in this place because you are an eagle in the house of God. See, a caretaking church is in maintenance mode. Energy is low. People are absent. Where's that leader? I don't know. They didn't come today. Whoop, that's a problem. Passion is quenched. 
And this is the big one. Ideas no longer flow. They're so wrapped up in the cares of this world, they stop advancing the kingdom of God. They're so wrapped up in their trials, they don't have fresh vision, and there's nothing fresh coming out of their life. They're so wrapped up in their own situation, they have no ideas flowing out of them. See, a hospital is a temporary place. Come on, somebody. A hospital was not built with the intention for living. It's a place for healing and repair. And once they heal you, once they repair you, once they prescribe you the medication, they send you home. Watch this. To get on with your life. <laughs> so I guess I got a word for somebody this morning. Guess what? Uh, you, you've been evicted from the hospital. <laughs> and it's time for you to get on with your life. Get on living. Get on leading. Get on worshiping. Get on giving. Get on letting those ideas begin to flow out of you again. We're going from an old season into a new season. Can anybody thank God that he's a healing God? He's a miracle working God. Woo. See, when I got saved, I needed a cure for my problems. How about you? I needed a cure. I came in with problems. I, had, I needed 10 miracles. But when I came to the house of God, watch this. I found what I was looking for. I found it. Terry neighbor, we found it. You know what it was? Yes, it was Jesus. Yes, it was the power of God. Yes, it was the people of God. But it was something more. I found something called vision. Before I came to Christ, problems pushed my life. But now, vision leads my life. And when I came to Victory Outreach, I found vision. And what vision did for me is what vision can do for you this morning. Watch this. Vision makes life bigger than your problems. When you didn't have Christ, your problems were the biggest thing in your life. But now that you have Jesus, you recognize your problems are just helping you get to the place that God has called you to be. Come on, somebody. I wake up and I don't think about my problems. I wake up and I think about my promise. I think about my vision. I think about God's plan. Is there anybody with me this morning that God has given you a vision? Woo. Let me give you the, the, the final thing this morning. Are you with me so far? The church that God has called Victory Outreach San Diego to be is not to be an undertaking church or a caretaking church, but finally, and I think this is so important, is he's called us to be a, a risk-taking church, a risk-taker. Tell your neighbor we're risk-takers. We're not dead. We're not stuck. We're willing to rise up to the challenge. A risk-taking church is filled with a certain type of people. A risk-taking church is a vision-driven, futuristic church filled with futuristic leaders who have been dipped. Come on, somebody. And I'm not just talking about being just dipped in water. I know some Christians that have been dipped in water who are deader than they were when they, before they were saved. Come on, somebody. They, they didn't dip them, they drowned them. And I'm not talking about being a church that's dipped in water. I'm talking about being a church that's dipped in vision. Being a church that's dipped in passion. Being a church that's dipped in the promises of God. Let me also say this. Being a church that's dipped in oil. Dipped in the power of God. Is there anybody that wants to be a part of a ministry that has been dipped in the power and the anointing of the living God? Let, let me tell you this, is that a risk-taking believer, to be a risk-taking church, to be a risk-taking believer is to be a church that knows that heaven is talking behind their back. I came to tell you this morning, my friend, what makes you different than any other church and any other people is that heaven is talking behind your back. 
There is a conversation going on in heaven about you, a conversation going on in heaven about your family, a conversation going on in heaven, going, about, going on about the miracle that you have become. It's, I can picture the angels talking to each other and say, look at them. Look how they used to be. They were all messed up. They were hooked on drugs. They were in and out of prison. Some of them had, were out of their mind. But Jesus died for them, and he cleansed them in the blood, and he filled them and dipped them in the Holy Ghost. And, and guess what, Michael? Guess what, Peter? Guess what, Gabriel? Look at them go now. They're moving towards the promise. They're moving towards the vision. They're moving. To that gets me excited this morning. Heaven is having a conversation about you. Heaven is talking about you this morning. God is saying, I'm opening up your future. God is saying, I've spoken a word of prophecy over your life. God is saying, I put a word over your life. And that word shall come to pass if you don't let yourself die and don't get stuck in your problems. But you wake up this morning and say, heaven is talking about me. Woo! We are risk takers. You know what a risk-taking believer is this? I want you to catch this part. This is the key. A risk-taking believer is one who moves in the prophetic nature of the people they worship with. <laughs> That's why if you're new this morning and you're worshiping this morning and you're new to this church, you're not sitting next to an ordinary believer. You, you, you're sitting next to somebody with a prophetic nature. that was saved in a ministry that heaven had a conversation about. <laughs> that was saved in a ministry that when no one would take the gang member and no one would take the drug addict, heaven went and had a conversation and said, we need a guy. We need a guy. There's a guy there. He was a heroin addict in New York City. And he was rejected by society. Why don't we go ahead and get a hold of him? Because he's got heart. He's got passion. He's got willingness. His name was Sonny Argonzoni. And God raised him up. And we are here today because we are the children of prophecy this morning. Took that man, hooked him up with a lady named Julie. And then he gave him a word. He gave him a word found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, 2 and 3. He said, I will go before you and I will make the crooked places straight. I will break down the gates of bronze. I will cut the bars of iron. And I got a question. Are there any treasures out of darkness in this place? This and he said, I'm not done. Tell your neighbor, he's not done. He gave him another word. Someone say another word. He said, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Do not hold back. Do not stay back. Do not die. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your set. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants. Are there any descendants here this morning? Shall take possession of the nation. I'm going to need you to give God praise for a prophetic word and a prophetic ministry. You're sitting next to a prophetic believer. And Victor Outreach San Diego, let me tell you this. If we're not prophetic, we're pathetic. I'll let you chew on that for a minute. I couldn't have made it in a pathetic church. I couldn't have made it in a Bible teaching church, boring church. I needed a ministry like Victory Outreach where there was a prophecy that God would break the generational curses in my family, break the generational curses in my home. Is there anybody here that could get grateful for a prophetic ministry and a prophetic people? prophetic we're pathetic <laughs> don't look at me like that don't look at me all mad come on if we're not prophetic we're pathetic Haggai spoke to the children of Israel he says don't go home and build your house and build a business build the house of God because you are a prophetic people and you will become the envy of all nations envy of all nations be seated. Oh, I'm preaching good this morning. You're making me feel good this morning. Thank you. 
See, we're prophetic people. And prophetic people are risk takers. Tell your neighbor, you're a risk taker. The word risk in the dictionary, watch this, means a situation involving danger. The word risk means to expose someone or something to danger, harm, or loss. I mean, though, that sounds scary. But I came to tell you this, Victor Outreach. This is powerful, man. When God gave me this, I've, my soul lit up. It's on the waters of risk where God commands the blessing. <laughs> Churches die because they stop risking. Christians die because they stop risking. But it's on the waters of risk. Somebody say risk. Where God commands the miracle. It's on the waters of risk where our faith comes alive. It's on the waters of new things when the people of God are prompted to activate their faith. And people who are risk takers understand that faith is the currency of heavenly transaction. <laughs> faith is what causes Heaven to come here. <laughs> Listen, the blood gets us from here to there. But faith gets heaven from there here. Who needs a little bit more heaven in your life? Who needs a little bit more heaven in your leadership? Someone say faith. It's on the waters of risk where faith is activated. In Psalms 107, verse 23, it says, Those who do business in deep waters see the works of the Lord. <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, If you want to catch some fish, if you want to fill your net, whoo, I'm tired of ha having empty nets. He says, you have to, this is so good, launch out into the deep. <laughs> you, you, you need to come out of the kiddie pool. There's nothing more embarrassing than having a kid, and you all have them, that's nine years old still wearing floaties in the pool. If my kid was nine years old and still had to put on that corny life vest just to go swimming, I wouldn't go to the pool with him. I'd be embarrassed. Oh, this is good stuff right here, isn't it? But when God calls you to the deep, you don't need a floaty. You got the presence of the living God with you. Come on, clap in this place. I'm almost done. You got the presence of God. Someone say risk. That's what we felt last week. Did you feel what we felt on that Friday night? Who's still walking in that whole thing? Who's still walking in that whole thing? Woo, we were here on Friday night, and we stepped out to take pledges for expanding our building. Go put over 1,000 seats, up to 1,200 seats in this place. Go back to one service, win new families, win new souls. But we knew it took money. And we stepped out as a church. Many of you stepped out to pledge. And some of you stepped out to pledge like you've never pledged before. There were people that pledged $10,000, $7,500, $5,000. I mean, I'm talking big, big pledges. And what did you feel in this place? See, if you were here, you know. Come on, nod to me like you. I was here, Pastor. I was here. I felt it. I felt the goosebumps. I felt the excitement. I felt the joy. People were giddy. They were like, hee. -hee. Our people were giddy. They were like, hee, oh my God. And they wanted, they were like buzzed, like they were high. 
I go, did somebody smoke marijuana? And they were just laughing and joking. And after the service, nobody wanted to leave. And they were talking. And they were just, just dreaming together. Just visualizing it together. What happened? Watch. Faith brought heaven to earth. Come on, clap. Like, you know what I'm talking Faith brought it down. Last week, we, we, in the second service, I preached on giving. I took pledges. You have one of the brothers who's been in this church a long time. He's a quiet man. He's a man of respect. He was raised in this church. The man is a man of respect. The business owner doesn't say much, doesn't shout when I preach. Sometimes I'm preaching. He looks at me like I don't even think he likes me. Oh, boy, was I wrong. I'm giving my presentation last Sunday about the things that we're going to do. And he was sitting right around that section. And I was done. And I said, we're going to take pledges. And this man jumped out of his chair. Interrupted my service. Had an envelope in his hand. Came up. It says, I'm giving it all now. I'm giving it all now. And then he even got more bold. He took the mic out of my hand. He took the mic out of my hand. And he says, I want to let you know, when I came into this church at 14 years old, I was all broken and messed up. But God saved me and he healed my family. I found my wife in this church. God has blessed my business. God has been good to my children. My kids are going to college. He says, how can I not give? I came to tell you, heaven came down to earth last week. And I wonder if heaven could hit this place this morning does anybody in this place have faith we are a prophetic people tell your neighbor we are prophetic stand with me I'm done preaching give God one big praise everybody come on give give God a praise come on let's clap in this place really clap in this place Come on, really give him praise right now. I'm, I'm done preaching. I got some more points, but I feel the anointing already. Come on, we're risk takers. We're stepping out. Heaven is going to invade our situation. Heaven is going to invade earth this year. Touch your neighbor and tell him we're risk takers. And as I close, I want to tell you this. Risk takers possess many things that other people do not have. You know where they carry it? They carry it in their life. They carry it in their spirit. Who wants to be filled? Who wants to be filled this morning? They possess things that other people don't have. You know, there's a few things. First, they're part of something bigger than themselves. They may not have earthly status, but they have heavenly status. <laughs> Their name is written in heavenly places, and they cause hell to tremble. Come on, where's my risk takers at? Cause hell to tremble. Secondly, they possess a strong prayer life. Strong prayer life. Because new territory and deep waters take your prayer to another level. I, I can't even be even so clear about it. It's just so evident here. The hunger for prayer. Some of you looking at me right now, you wish I wouldn't preach. You wish I would just call a prayer meeting. There's such a hunger for prayer here. You say, oh, Pastor, we need to pray. Because when you step out, it causes your prayer hunger and your prayer life to go up. How many can say amen? Risk takers possess things others don't have. Thirdly, they have backing the world doesn't have. The angels of heaven are watching over God's word to perform it in your life. And risk takers, watch this. That even though man says they shall fail, 
God says they won't because they're protected and preserved by my angels. I thought you'd get happier about that. Come on, how many, how many could use some heavenly help in your life? Risk takers have qualities others don't have. They see things happen others will not see. They acquire and are acquainted with miracles. They experience deliverance in their life. What am I saying? Fire can't burn them and water can't drown them. And sickness can't take their life. Come on, somebody. You are a risk taker. You are full of faith. You have what the world does not have. They experience blessing that does not fade or vanish. Because risk takers know that only what you do for Christ will last. And their blessing, watch this, cannot be quantified by material things. It can't be. You could drive a nice car, but be like, oh, that's not my blessing. You could live in a nice house and be like, yeah, but that's, it's just a house. Their blessing is in that they're building a legacy in people. <laughs> Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, give it all away. Because the only thing that's going to move you in my kingdom, move your own heart. How many want their heart to be moved? But it's not the car you drive or the money you make. It's the people you impact. This is too good. Come on, this is too good. You say, that, oh, I don't care about that car. I don't care about that house. They, but, but then when someone says, hey, that, look at that guy, how good he's doing. You say, well, that's my disciple. Oh, see that girl? Man, she's come a mighty long way. And, and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's my disciple. They say, oh, look at your kids, how they're serving God. You get goosebumps. She's like, yes. That's the buzz I've been wanting. Come on, somebody, you catching this this morning? Risk takers. They possess a passion that burns brighter than the world. Fire flows out of them. They have qualities and traits that other envy. Other envy. When you're a risk taker, you, you have qualities and traits that others envy, and it's not based on your looks. There's so many people that... You know, they look good on the outside, but they're ugly on the inside. You know, I wish they could swallow their makeup. <laughs> Highlight your soul. Come on, somebody. But, but, but the people are not going to envy you based on how you look. This is powerful. They're going to envy you based on the anointing in your life. It, 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 I can't tell you, the anointing looks good on you. It's the anointing that makes you look handsome or beautiful. It's the, because <laughs> you know when that anointing's gone, you look like a creature from the Black Lagoon. But when that anointing is poured out and rubbed on your life, People say there's something about that person. I can't identify it. I don't know what it is. I came to tell you it is the anointing and the favor of the Holy Ghost. Woo. Touch your neighbor and tell them the anointing looks good on you. Should I keep going? I got to end. Let me end. I got so much more I'm going to end. But the last thing is that when you're a risk taker, what you're doing 
is through your anointing. Say, through my anointing. I'm opening up the future for others. You were the first to get free from drugs, but now watch how your family is going to stay free from drugs. You were the first to answer the call. Watch how God raises up others in your family that are going to answer the call. You're a risk taker. You're breaking into new territory. You're stepping into deeper waters. You're moving into greater authority. Come on and clap in this place. This is a prophetic word. This is a prophetic word this morning. This is a necessary word this morning. I know you're receiving it like it is. Come on and thank Him for the word. Come on and say, yes, God. We shall not die. We shall not stay stuck. We're going to move into deep waters this year. We're going to another level. And if you're here this morning, you say, I need to make this altar call, Pastor. This is a prophetic word over my life. I want you to come on up. I want you to